Hi, I'm Dick Turpin. I'm a 40-year veteran of the Nebraska Game and Parks Commission, retired back in 99. But in those years, that 40 years that I spent, I did a, quite a few jobs for the Game and Parks Commission, and I enjoyed it all, saw a lot of the outdoors. But one of the things that always got my goat when I was on as a game warden in 1961, up in the northeast part of the state, was I'd get mountain lion reports. And I'd run them down, you know, and it'd always be a dog track. I, I, I guess I did see a couple of bobcat tracks, but they're pretty small in comparison. Up in the northeast Nebraska, up along the Missouri River, you know, good oak woods and everything. I never did. And, and we didn't in the state, far as that goes, until in the 90s. And uh, I got a lot of criticism after I saw this mountain lion finally. But uh, Dr. Uh, Simmons over at the Henry Dorley Zoo, he said it right, I think. He said, you know, the mountain lion has been something that has just kind of come on in the last eight or ten years. And uh, I think he was right. I think maybe in the 90s it kind of started, that migration of those cats out of the mountains kind of started, and they wound up out here on the prairie. Now, what happened to me, I, would, I didn't want to see this. I'm telling you that. I was up north of Ainsworth hunting on a friend's place, and I'm driving around the edge of the canyons. We'd had a big snowstorm. The, the, uh, the muzzleloader season was what we were up there to hunt for. So I, I took my pickup and I was driving around the edge of these canyons and right in front of that trail, across and dropping off into the canyon, great big mountain lion. And there's no doubt, when you see a mountain lion that close, there's absolutely no, there's no way you can mistake it for anything else. The first thing you notice is the tail. It looks so huge on a mountain lion. And it was just trotting. Went right across in front of the, the pickup, probably maybe 15 yards, and down over the edge of the canyon. Well, I stopped the pickup and I didn't want to believe it because the old naysayer here, I'd said no on mountain lions for years and years. And all of a sudden here I am faced with seeing one in my own home country. That's where I come from, up in that country. So I knew right now I was in for uh, quite a ration of criticism, let's say. But anyway, I got out of the pickup then and took a camera that I had just a steel camera and took some pictures of the tracks. And then I tracked that cat back out under that little, there was a little poplar grove there, uh, poplar trees. And I had to stand there. That's where I was going to hunt. I was, that's what I was checking out. And right there under that stand is a dead four by four white tailed buck, a nice one. Probably three and a half year old deer and that cat had killed it and it had been feeding on it. And this was about 4.30 in the afternoon and it had covered it back up, typical cat kill. So when I got back to the cabin that night, I made a comment about, guess what I saw, and of course everybody guessed moose, elk, all the other things you see once in a while. And when I said mountain lion, boy, everybody got excited. Well, the one kid had a really nice video camera, and I told him, I said, you ought to go up there and film that cat, because he'll be back, he'll be in there feeding on that deer. He's just getting started. So what I learned later, it takes him five, six days to clean up a deer. And uh, so a deer lasted about a week. And this cat fed on this one for five days. So that was kind of typical too. But uh, the, the guy that had the camera, he was scared. He's, he's from New York and he didn't, want to, he didn't want to go there with that camera. He said, here, you take the camera. He gave me a quick lesson on the camera and so I took it up there the next day. We're in a canyon country there north of Ainsworth in Brown County. Here's where the cat killed that deer. He came right over the top of some small trees that that deer was laying up against to stay out of that wind. And I think he lit right on that deer's head. And the reason I do, you can, you can, you can kind of see the dark places in the snow is the blood. That deer bled and bled and bled. And his nostrils were split in two. That reason I think that cat lit on his head and he had a hold of his head and his antlers. And he raked that deer and one of those claws was right between his nostrils. And that cut went clear to the bone it was just white in the bottom and clear up to above between his eyes. Uh, he, just, he just split him open. Now that was not a mortal wound, but with that mountain lion on his head, he couldn't do much. But you can see where he scraped to cover it up. Now this, place, this thing right here is where I took the still. See those leaves where they're hollowed out there? That, that's about 75 yards from where he killed the deer. And wh there's his trail coming right up. He, that's where he was laying to protect that deer. The breeze was out of the south and he could smell anything that came up over it. And he just dropped over the edge of that canyon and, uh, and uh, made a nest there where he could lay in comfort 
get out of the wind and be warm and uh, guard that. That's the size of that track. It was about four inches across. I can reach ten. So it was a, they tell me that's a big cat track. But you can see where he walked up in there. And uh, I took some plaster casts. I got some good ones. But they, you see where they double step? They step in their old track with their hind feet. They step in the front track. And it's really hard to get a clean one. But I finally did. The clock is wrong here. It's actually 4.54. I figured he'd come out about then, and I, I got in the tree about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, so I thought I'd beat him, and I did. And uh, he came out right kind of when I figured he would. This is, I, I, that camera, I just had a short lesson, and I couldn't, right here I'm trying to find where the camera's even on. I thought I had it running, but I couldn't see the little red light on the screen, my little flop-out screen on the side. <laughs> so I'm, I'm looking around trying to see where the heck I'm at, and I finally, Finally discovered that the camera was on and got on the, got on the cat. They're an awful pretty animal. And he's a, he's a, you know, being said, they thought he was a young Tom, but I wasn't, and I knew he wasn't, uh, simply because I sat there and watched him. He was a good sized animal. And I just figured it was an adult Tom, because when he walked away, I could see it was a Tom. And uh, the uh, experts that looked at it at first thought it was a young Tom, but they finally came around and said, no, it's an adult male, is what it is. And he uh, pretty much was right there. He's kind of in the chest cavity. See what that, he kind of tore the flank open, but he's kind of right in the, right in the rib cage, kind of cleaning up. And you can see the deer now. You can see the antler there kind of curled around, his nose sticking up. That's how he laid there all the time. But that, that cat, see, he can hear that lanyard every once in a while. There's a lanyard on that camera. It's got a little string on it, and that wind was blowing hard, and it, it hit. It hit the camera, and then that cat would look around, and he couldn't, he couldn't quite pick it out because it was above him. But he finally, uh, he finally, after hearing it so much, he finally decided where it was and that's when he finally got, there's the, I always say that's the first time I changed my underwear when I got off the, I was trying to get it so I could zoom in on him a little, manipulate it. Look at these claws come out there. That's so neat, look at that. He was, uh, he was pretty hungry. He was tearing right at it. I finally decided I'd just get a, a good view of the cat and leave it there. Because I was having too much trouble trying to, trying to run the camera and figure out everything I needed to figure out. I can tell you this from just the looks of it around where he killed that deer. There was a violent, violent struggle. I'd have just, I'd have loved to have been there and seen that. Because boy, they tore up an area. And there was, right from the get-go, there was blood all over the snow. So it must have been a really a violent, a violent kill on the, on the part of the mountain lion. See, you heard that click again. See how he looked? You could hear that. I heard it again. Now. He saw me here. His eyes actually in the video, his eyes actually cross. And it's just like he steps around there to look at his tail go. He steps around there to protect his kill is what he's doing. And I'm thinking, you know, one jump and he can have me. And I got a 54 caliber muzzleloader. But when he did that right there, I knew I was safe because what he was doing was checking his way back to the canyon. He was going to leave and go right back out his path, and I knew that. I got off of him here some. I was probably trying to get my gun scooted back up on my knee there. Now I'm going to make a reference here when he gets when he gets up here a ways. I'll show you. The next morning when I went up there, the deer was gone, and I couldn't figure out where it was. 
And uh, so I thought, what the heck's gone on? He didn't, he couldn't have eaten all that, but it was gone. And what he did was, he walks up here and he gets behind some little pop or scrubs here. You'll see what I mean. He gets where he can't hardly see me and I surely can't hardly see him. And what he does is he stops here now and he looks back and he stands there a little bit and he figures out, see how he stands right there? He figures out that if he, if he got that deer up there and there was something there bothering him, it couldn't see him. And where he stood and looked, the next morning that's where that deer laid in behind that brush so he couldn't film him when he was eating. So I don't know whether you call that instinct or what, but to me it almost provoked the idea that he had a thought process <laughs> because he hid the deer from me from where I was. And here where he's going now under that fence when he crosses over and drops over into that canyon is where I showed you that nest uh, where he'd kind of pawed out the leaves. Uh, after I got the video of the cat, uh, it hung around there. It took it about five, six days to clean up that deer. But then it moved about a mile. It moved west up along the creek valley there and actually set up a same kind of a, an attack area that it had where it killed the deer that, that was by my stand. And so he was still hunting deer. And they saw him the next year up there also. Uh, they got him on a trail camera, identified him by the dappling under his front legs here. He was taking a step. He had a real dark crease in his forehead, and they have a dark little bit of hair there, but his was just like you'd spray painted. And the experts that looked at it said that's one way you could identify him, because you never saw that on any mountain lions, that, that distinct of a mark. But this cat, they identified him with the dappling under his legs. It was the same cat. He was there a year later still hunting that same area. I, uh, I, it, was, it was a heck of an experience for me, uh, being a naysayer that I was, it was a heck of an experience for me to sit there in that tree and video of that cat and have him, have him walk around like he did, you know, and kind of spook you a little bit and, 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 and do some of the things he did, his behavior. But they're a beautiful, beautiful animal. I don't know that if it had been legal to shoot one, if I'd even shot at it because I, as I'm sitting there looking at it, you know, just the color, the color of the animal, the color of his nose, his face, just the look of them. It's uh, kind of outstanding. It's something that I surely will not forget the rest of my life.